Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the 365 Message Center Show. On this week's episode, we're going to talk about Yammer Reactions being inclusive, the new search experience in Compose Mode for Outlook on the web, and Microsoft Teams has a revised in-meeting sharing experience. Let's roll. Yes, here we are. We are on episode 179. Daryl, can you believe it? I, As these numbers go higher and higher, I am just finding myself just feeling so wonderful that we're actually bringing some value to people uh, in the community uh, for what we're doing. Uh, I'm pretty excited. I'm, We've I'm got a rhythm going, haven't we? Yeah. Um, and it's been fun changing up the format over the years mm -hmm. and uh, enjoying this new format too. Yeah, so we will do kind of what we did last episode in 178. We will cover some messages, talk about some quick mentions, uh, messages that maybe we won't dive into, but just mention, make sure you're aware, and then do a callback. Uh, this week is uh, on an iOS app, so we'll be talking a little bit about that uh, toward the end of the show. Um, so I think we just jump right into it if you're okay with that. Is that all right? Sure, I'm okay with okay. that. Okay, so what we have uh, first up is uh, some reactions being inclusive, Daryl. Can you sh tell us all about this? Yeah, um, for a while we've uh, been able to react within, actually it is a recent thing, isn't it? Yeah, reactions in YAM is a recent thing. You can like a few things. We've been doing that for years, mm -hmm. but they added a few more to try and show a bit more emotion to different posts. Uh, I, don't, I know that there were some interesting comments around that because um, Yammer chose different reactions to what's available in Microsoft Teams. So mm -hmm. there's a yay for consistency. That's right. Uh, but this uh, this message, uh, let me uh, find that number. It was MC235133. Uh, is about... Uh, trying to make Yammer reactions more inclusive by bringing in skin tones that you can configure. Um, and this is great. I mean, it means that you can identify a bit more with that's your like. And uh, as you do like that message, um, and it also, <laughs> that's a clap, apparently. Oh, no, it's not a clap. It's a it's a thanks that, that um, what is it? One, two, three, four. Five, the fifth icon <laughs> along there on the screen. Good counting, <laughs> Good count. Daryl. Yeah, counting. that's right. Five, five fingers. Yeah. Anyway, um, that yeah. There's it only if this this configuration only affects those two reactions, a like or a thanks, which is your hands together with what looks like noise. Hmm. Um, the rest of the reaction, so the heart's not going to change, of course. The um, emoticon faces will remain uh, what we're reading as unrealistic yellow. <laughs> We see this phrase yes, in the do. message of this message uh, center uh, this time around. It's interesting. What do you, what do you think about that, Daniel? Because, um, yeah, yeah. I, I've always called it Simpsons yellow, but what do you call it? Well, <laughs> um, I don't know. I just call it default emoji. I don't know. Um, that bright yellow, I think everyone, it, it, at least I recognize that as being just a generic, you know, color mm. that is unrealistic um and you're <laughs> right in this message I, that was something that kind of jumped out at me it was just that language talking about the default yep. generic unrealistic yellow reaction um it just just basically saying uh this is the default out of the box um re and not trying to you know be one way or the other it's just whatever um default color there is but um so this mess, just as you were talking about, this update is going to be great to be able to choose those thumbs and those thanks. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they're going to. I mean, there's no talk in this message whatsoever about, you know, changing the faces of those reactions, right? Well, they, they do mention um, in there that they made sure that of the five skin tones that they um, had developed mm -hmm. uh, or chosen, um, that it will... Uh, present nicely over dark mode so that um, you can still see um, some difference between the, mm. the skin tone and in the background gotcha. uh, i imagine though that yeah i mean the uh, emoticon side of things that 
I actually haven't seen any platform do that necessarily. They do have the. Um, they're not, yeah, they are emoticons, aren't they? So there mm-hmm. are like sort of running people and, and people doing different jobs and stuff. I think yeah. that's the, the case within the Windows icons. But anyway, enough, enough of uh, talking so much about that. Um, you can set that when you visit the Yammer web app and go up to your settings cog, and there'll be a setting there which is choose skin tone for reactions. Once you've set it there, it will also reflect in the Yammer mobile experience and within the communities app within Microsoft Teams. Mm-hmm. That's right. So that, um, uh, actually, I don't have the message open there. So that is rolling out uh, early February. Yeah. Well, finished by early February. Yeah, mid-January, which, so it should be rolling out now to um, starting out now. And, uh, yeah, early February. So. Yeah. Now, uh, Daniel, the... Microsoft Teams is predominantly an online thing, isn't it? But it is. Uh, and there's something now that's uh, landing in that uh, provides some offline experience for Teams. Yeah, that's uh, the message is Microsoft Teams will queue sent messages when offline MC two three five three six nine. And I think a lot of us have experienced this, um, and sometimes it's accidentally. For me, it's accidentally. Uh, I moved my office around. Those that have been watching the show probably noticed that there's a difference. We talked a little bit about this a few months back, but uh, I've had some network problems that I've been working out with some network gear. And every once in a while, I'm just working along and, and teams will be, you know, you'll get the message of network connectivity and like, what's going on? It it basically, you know, breaks, it won't let me do anything. And I look down in windows and go, Oh, network's down. So, you know, something's wrong. Uh, so, uh, this message is all about a really a kind of an offline experience where you create messages. So, and it's broken down in two phases, as you'll notice here at the top of the message. Phase one begins late January, so coming soon, and should be completed early February. And then phase two is end of January, uh, and should be completed by mid-February. So I don't know what the difference between end of January and late February, but I think late February comes before end. Uh, that's what I'm guessing. So basically right now, the way this works is uh, Teams does label messages as failures that you're trying to send if you don't have network connectivity. Mm. Um, so it, it prompts you to retry, you know, maybe there was a momentarily blip in your network connectivity or whatever, and it, and it says, do you want to, you know, retry or delete. In phase one, Uh, You'll be able to, when you're on offline, you'll be able to queue those messages on your local device. Now, what this means is don't think about going to another computer and seeing those same messages that are queued up in your Mm. offline machine. Makes sense, right? It's offline. There's no way for those to (laughs) communicate. Teams will automatically send those messages when the device resolves connectivity within 24 hours. Um, so that just keep that in mind within 24 hours, uh, it will, once it connects, then it will automatically send those messages, which could be interesting if you think about in the order Mm. of things, as you're having a conversation with someone and, um, you go offline and then you say, say things and then you come back online and it throws it. Well, that person may have already said a few things, but, um, (laughs) it's going to automatically send that. So if it remains in an unsent state for more than 24 hours, then the message will fail and Mm. it'll kind of revert back to the, what it, the experience you have now teams will say, do you want to try to resend or delete the message? Which is nice because it doesn't just get rid of it. You can actually go in and, um, and attempt to resend it. Uh, In phase two, we talked about two phases. In phase two, you'll actually be able to edit messages. I am very much looking forward to this. You'll be able to edit messages that are queued. So when when you have, you're offline, you're you're, uh, composing those messages, then you'll be able to edit them um, in that queued state. So I, I agree with this message here at the bottom. It talks about you might want to notify your users about this. I agree because it it is changing the way things happen. People may be used to 
getting that message of failed, right? Uh, retry or delete. And now it's going to be, it's just going to queue it and actually go ahead and send it for you. Mm. So um, that's, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. What, have you had any experience with this, Daryl, with trying to compose and teams not have connectivity? Well, there's a few things I wonder about here too. That is that the same experience across, let's say, a mobile app because, mm. you know, with iOS, apps will time out in the background and then yeah. they effectively are yeah. just refreshing and picking things up. So if I type out a message in the mobile app, is that still going to uh, – well, oh, yeah, this, I can see it. Yeah, yeah web and desktop. It's web and desktop. But I wouldn't – I w could foresee this coming to the iOS app. I don't know anything, I, I, no secret um, information mm. or anything about that, but I would imagine that this would come to the mobile app as well. Mm. No, it's, it's a good thing to, to see come. Uh, and you know, hopefully we'll see more um, offline experiences mm -hmm. coming for Teams. I do remember... And it might be related, uh, but Phil Worrell, if you're there, Phil, in the chat, you know, holler out. Um, he and Stephen Collier were having uh, a chat about how many messages are available in Teams chat when you scroll back. Mm. And uh, there was a, a certain message count. I forget what it was. And they are cached locally on your machine. So you could go back and interact and reply to, I guess, any of those or potentially um, edit them mm -hmm. in phase two and, um, and see that. Interesting. Yeah. So next message, we're staying in Teams. Um, this is, I think, it, this is our title here, but this is the kind of um, a revision of the sharing experience. Right, Daryl? Mm. Yeah, that's right. Um, Microsoft Teams revised in-meeting share experience. Um, that is message MC23511. Mm -hmm. And... Think about today when we share content in a meeting. We click the share button at the top right-hand corner and this big tray pops up from the bottom which spans the full meeting window. And we've got columns of content, this thin, skinny little column that may represent the desktop that you're sharing or if you've got multiple screens, those are there. And then most of the screen is taken up by all the windows that you may have available. So you could choose to share just a window. Uh, there's apps and then, of course, there's um, PowerPoints that you might have recently presented. Um, so Daniel's uh, kindly uh, opening up the uh, screenshot from the message, and I'll describe it a bit for the, uh, the podcast listeners as well, um, that the new experience will, will be a consolidated uh, little pop-out up near the share button. So when you go to share content, it doesn't take up the full screen, and that's a nice consolidated way of saying, Here's the screen or screens you can share. And beside that will be the windows that you can share. And I note that in that screenshot there, Daniel, in this example, the person has 12 windows mm -hmm. that are open, 12 applications. And uh, so I, we don't see it in the message, but if you click into that, I'm sure you'll see an expanded view of all the windows you can choose from. Mm -hmm. I hope to see the same for screens that you might share if you've got multiple screens. Yeah. Uh, there's the Microsoft Whiteboard app, and I expect there'll be other apps there too if you've installed them to use. That's a space there, isn't it, Daniel, where they are adding more experiences in terms of apps into meetings. It's not related directly to this message, right? but we'd see more there, wouldn't we? Yes, and I I think this is a great way to, you know, giving some space to expand that list. Um, mm. so, so I agree with you that any other apps that we've got to connecting into this experience would be, uh, that would be the place for them. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also, you know, I love the including the computer sound switch here at the top, making it super easy. You know, that's something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, so, you know, making that um, quickly available for, mm. uh, for everybody. And we'll, we'll actually doing a quick mention on another, um, topic that's related to this here and shortly, yeah. but I'm, I'm really liking that. The, the thing I like about uh, this consolidated view too is um, people often got confused and they were sharing content and they would choose a window when they meant mm -hmm. to choose their full desktop and someone's presenting and they're talking away and then they seem to be talking about something completely different and it takes one of us to chime in and say, um, 
are you sharing a different application? And yeah. there's all that kerfuddle of right. like, oh, oh, actually, wait, Whoops. I'm just going to share my desktop yeah. instead of the application. So this should tidy that that up and hopefully hopefully get the experience hopefully so i mean uh, this i think it kind of depends on what people interpret screen to be mm. um mm. I, I don't know that's going to be interesting you know because i think maybe monitor or desktop or i don't know it, this is mm. i think I'm, I'm not entirely sure there is a right answer here but saying window and then versus what's this other thing so that there is no confusion um, it will be interesting if this is a preview of your screen, uh, you know, like mm. it is to where you can, you know, be able to, uh, like we're used to, you know, making sure that we still have that same experience. So that'll be interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that is rolling out uh, time in mid-February um, through to mid-March uh, mm -hmm. this year. Um, so looking forward to seeing that. Yeah. Um, now, Daniel, uh, what have we got next for you? We've got um, some stuff around SharePoint and usage. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is updates coming to SharePoint Site Usage Report, MC235392. And this, oh, I get the phases. So this is another message with phases. So in phase one. I'm sure that's not phasing you, right? No, I'm not phased. Um the in phase one, they're adding eight new metrics to the SharePoint usage report. Cool, right. we get eight new metrics. Uh, I think I get questions about SharePoint analytics uh, very frequently, uh, several times a month from different clients of what can we get from SharePoint analytics? How can we improve this? Or, or you know, what is it available and how can we export? You know, all those types of questions. So anything we can add. Mm -hmm is great. So phase one, adding those new eight new metrics. Phase two, they're going to take two of those new ones and incorporate those definitions in the active sites and active files area. So those two are anonymous link count and company link count. Um, so that will be, and which is kind of interesting, when they reclassify that information, they're also going to backfill your report for 180 days. So hmm. when you look at your report, once they've done it, it'll actually include 180 days of that reclassification. So that's pretty great. Uh, the phase uh, one, late January uh, is the timing. And then phase two, February 19th. So this is interesting. We're, it's not talking about whether this is a targeted tenant or standard tenant or e even government. We have no idea here um, how this is happening. Um, but it says late January. So uh, whatever that means. But then phase two, th they give us a, sp a specific date, February 19th. So I wanted to call that out. That's an interesting part of this message. All right. So what are the eight? new metrics. We have anonymous link count, which I mentioned before, and that's the number of times documents or folders um, were shared with the sharing of an anyone with the link. Okay, mm. so anonymous link count. Uh, company link count, same thing except for they selected to share with people in the org with the link. Uh, and if you've been, been to any of my sessions about sharing or workshop that drew Madelung and I did um, in several places, but um, conferences, but basically what that means is people within the organization that have the link, you're not giving them permission until they click that link. And once they click that link, then they're added to permissions for that, um, for that content. But, oh. but this one is company link count. So how many times I shared with that link external sharing, um, so this, in this list of eight, it, I was confused a little bit, not, not much, but I, I came back to it, uh, to my senses, um, because one and two are sharing link, uh, definitions. How did you share this content? And then three is not three is what are the site external, um, shareable settings? What are the settings for this site? And then the fourth is geolocation, which is the uh, location of the site. Where is it? And then we're back to sharing content uh, with specific links and how we're how it's used. So 
The fifth one is secure link for guest account. So that's the number of times documents and folders or, or folders uh, were shared using specific people and then adding guests, okay, to the content. So that's a uh, secure link for guest account, count, not account. <laughs> then the sixth one is secure link for member count. And again, sharing content for specific people, but adding people within your organization. I actually think this should be secure link for um, company count, but it's member count, because that would uh, be kind of reflective of the same thing of the number two here, the company link count. Anyway, um, the seventh one is, and then we switch again. <laughs> the seventh one is site sensitivity label ID. Uh, so this is the sensitivity label configured uh, for the site. And then the eighth one is unmanaged device policy, site access policy for unmanaged devices. So it goes shareable content and then some information about the site with external sharing and geolocation and then sharing content and then site sensitivity and unmanaged device policy. That's why I was a little confused because it was switching very mm. oddly with this. But anyway, um, so just as I mentioned before, phase two, changing those anonymous link count and company link count will be brought in with the regular um, definition of sharing content of uh, active site and active files. Uh, what you need to do to prepare, you know, review the site usage data. And uh, if you're doing any kind of reporting using the Microsoft Graph API, then you need to aware, be aware that kind of the, the metrics are going to be changing a little bit um, and that additional data to work with, uh, however you're using that API, will be available as well. Um, so that's a lot of information we covered on this one because it there was a lot of detail there. And I'm going to let me pull up the uh, this just wanted to pull up for those on the on the uh, video, just showing you what this new usage report is going to look like with um, the sites and uh, files and storage and pages. But kind of just showing that those active sites versus total sites are incorporating that sharing content. So. Um, but that's where it's going to be. So anyway, fun times, right? Yeah, I think the, the, the new information around the types of links that are shared and content that's anonymous and not anonymous and members and <laughs> guests, that's all quite useful for making mm -hmm. those decisions about, um, you know, who who's sharing this content and do we need to go back and review um, some security around that? Um, yeah, it just yeah. it really gives you a insights as to how the content is being used, right? How how are things going, I guess, mm. you know, when you're doing reports. Mm. So, yeah. All right. Uh so kind of our last deep dive, I guess, or dive into a message is yours, Daryl. Um and this is all about search in compose mode. Yeah, I this one surprises me. Um where this is for Outlook on the web. And as you're composing a message, you can use a forward slash and it will begin to suggest files that you might want to attach to your email. Uh, a bit like our experience when we type in the at mention symbol and we get people that we su are suggested to us that we could mention within the body of the message. So this is all about what we type in the body of the message. Uh, this is message uh, MC235500. And uh, yeah, as a forward slash, there you know away it goes. Um, it's it's available there to to suggest files that you've recently worked on. As you type characters after that forward slash, it's going to narrow it down based on what you're typing. And so if you are remembering what that file is called, then it will help you find it a bit easier. In the screenshot, what we see is a, a few um, there's a word document, a couple of spreadsheets. Noticing the notes there too. I think notes uh, being that they're pages within a a OneNote um, a OneNote uh, notebook because we do see that uh, sometimes in the uh, activity dialog and activity uh, web part on on SharePoint pages. But I, I think that'll be quite useful for working from um, Outlook on the web and mentioning a file, so to speak, using the forward slash. 
Uh, hopefully, I mean, we don't see anything within the uh, the screenshot about what this looks like. Is it going to be a hyperlinked name of the document with the um, extension at the end? Uh, it should signify that you can click on it and you'll be able to see it. Yeah, I think it's uh, going to be that same experience. You know, when you when you yeah. go to attach um, and it it shows the name of it now, you know, uh, which is kind of spiffy, right? When you're attaching, mm. it puts it doesn't put in like a URL or anything. It puts the name mm -hmm. of it um, right there and then, of course, shows in the attachments. Yeah. Yeah. And I expect, too, that it, it'll trigger off. Um, that sharing experience too. When you do attach something to an email, um, that it's making sure that the mm -hmm. people you're sending it to in that to line, they have permission to the file. So interesting one there. Um, and it's going to be rolling out ooh, targeted release early February 2021 to mid February. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll re roll out to standard release uh, late February and be complete by late May. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Good guidance there. So that is our standard message section. And we did have quite a bit to to get on through. Um, but there's a few quick mentions we want to make. Yes. Uh, maybe just a couple. There's one there yeah. which is a bit, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, oh, look, it's my one again. So this one's a, a quick mention for, for Mac users. And that is uh, MC235180. That's uh, Teams desktop app for Mac uh, will be able to include uh, system sound. We talked about a, mm -hmm. um, a, a new sharing experience for for Windows desktop users, and the switch there has been available for quite some time to share your system audio, but hasn't been available for Mac. And just as a side story, I know we're just going to quickly mention uh, this message, but one of my most popular videos on my YouTube channel has been, how do you share your system mm -hmm. sound into a Teams meeting? Um, surprisingly, not really, uh, teachers and schools and educators and people who like to, to um, show and play videos and, and, and demonstrate sounds as part of what they're showing in a meeting, all interested in this. But mm -hmm. poor old Mac users couldn't do this right through this COVID experience. So it is coming. And uh, what, what you will have to do as you use it for the first time It'll prompt you to install a audio driver. I guess this is Windows uh, way of, sorry, Microsoft's way of working around it with Apple. Um, but good to see that it is an option there for Mac users very mm -hmm. shortly. Um, so that was coming. Whoops. Bit slow here with my clicking messages. Oh, I can probably see it on the screen there better than <laughs> clicking on my own screen. Um, complete complete right. early February uh, for tenants. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Um, and beginning late January. Uh, this is including uh, production and GCC. Mm -hmm. uh, roll out to GCC H and DOD tenants. Mid February should be complete by February 2021. So, All right. a, a quick ish mention. mention. <laughs> yeah. So, another quick mention that I would like to make is Microsoft 365 Admin App adds license management. This is MC234989. Um, I use my uh, mobile app for administrating. Uh, Microsoft 365 and now not only are we going to be able to use uh, you know see all the messages and the health and all that but now we're going to be able to manage user licenses so um, I think that's pretty cool but we can also buy new uh, or remove licenses um, so getting more features and functionality I think is nice because um, a lot of us are on the go a lot and we need that access without having to you know fire up the laptop so, so this is the admin mobile app, mm -hmm. not just just the admin experience in yeah. the web browser. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that is good. Yeah. Um, we won't worry about that other little quick mention. Okay. Sounds mysterious, right? Because right. people can't see our <laughs> list. But we'll just <laughs> we'll jump to that that one callback that we managed to fish out from our archive. Yes. And it was something we mentioned a couple of shows ago. The Microsoft Lists app for iOS, MC232966, uh, landed last week. Um, we saw a tweet there from Mark Cashman promoting it as well. And um, I quickly put it on the phone there to try things out. I think it's it's quite a usable app on the mobile. But I think, Daniel, what was your experience putting it on an iPad? Yeah, on the iPad, it's it's 
Um, hmm, I make sure I don't use too colorful language. Uh, it was it was kind of junk. I mean, if anyone who uses it was usable, okay. It was just the user interface uh, is the same as the phone. If you use the Instagram app on your iPad, you've had the same experience where you open it up on the iPad and it's small, and you can click this little button and it goes, you know, and you're like, oh great, but all you're doing is zooming. Um, you have to use it in portrait mode yeah. too, hey? So <laughs> it is, uh, it's, it, it's still usable. It's just, it's not made for the iPad. It seems like it's mm. made for the iPhone, but it's still usable. You're able to add content, add list items, edit list items. Um, so yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't been using um, Microsoft Lists a whole lot, um, but when I put the app on, what I, what mm -hmm. I did like was that as I'm adding an item to a list, I have an option to attach things. And from the iOS yeah. app, when I go to attach a photo, so using my live camera, mm -hmm. I can take pictures uh, just like I'm using Office Lens and I can scan a document or a whiteboard yeah. and that becomes an attachment too. So I like to see the integration. What were you hoping for in that space, Daniel? Yeah, so when we talked about this a few, I don't know, two weeks ago, um, I was really hoping this to bridge the gap between uh, users having a list and then going, oh, I need access on a mobile to edit that list, uh, whether they're on the factory floor or traveling or whatever it is to, um, to be able to interact with that list. And what people have been doing is creating a power app uh, for that list so they can publish that app in the power apps mobile app and it, and it work well. But with that, you get a little bit of overhead of management of that of that power app. And I just felt like maybe it was a kind of a middle ground where you don't need to do anything extra. You could just interact with the list mm. uh, in a way that is useful for you, but on the mobile uh, and, but it's full featured. And, and from what I've seen, it does fill that gap. I'm um, I am enjoying it. You're one thing I like about it is you're able to create, you know, a, a whole list right from there. Uh, there yeah. are some, you know, templates you can select from and, and all that. So I, I actually uh, was pleasantly surprised when I was like, Oh, I, I hope it does this. And then kind of did. So I, hmm. I'm looking forward to that for yeah, more people definitely. using it. Yeah. Oh, and uh, even with the list too, uh, you can hold your phone landscape and it will allow you to mm -hmm. see a bit more of that list as well. Not just right. showing you two columns. So get into it. If you haven't already, it has landed and uh, enjoy that's yeah. our callback for the week uh we'll keep an eye out for other things landing uh through this week and community reactions and discussions but that's the show today isn't it daniel it is we appreciate all of you being with us remember go to our website messagecenter.show to um, make sure you can uh, follow our podcast so you can download the audio for this. And, and uh, you could also share episodes with your coworkers from there as well. Uh, so, and then of course, interact with us on the socials. Um, so we're at three, six, five MCS on the socials. So thank you everyone for joining us today. All right. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>